Hello. Okay. January 1st, 1942. Turned 18 years old. It was three weeks after the Battle of Pearl Harbor. You probably know a little bit about that. We're going to let him talk about that and start off with that. So why don't you share a little bit about what happened at the beginning of Pearl Harbor and where, where things took for you from there. First of all, let me just say, well, and then you have to allow for me breathe when you're as old as me. You take things easy. I want you to know I'm not a hero. I'm just a guy that served in the Navy aboard a great ship. Does everybody know what the Canberra is, and what, who it is, and where it is? Does anybody realize what it is? Nobody? Somebody in history class must know what Canberra is. It's the capital of Australia. In 200 years, it's the only ship that's ever been named for a foreign capital in the history of the United States Navy. The only one. There is no other ship ever named. And it was done to honor a little ship that was sunk helping us in a battle one time. So they honored it by calling it the USS Canberra. Our ship was originally going to call, be called the USS Baltimore, but they changed the name to the Canberra. And, and there's a hat sitting there that a white hat. That was last year, was our 75th anniversary. I had 1,600 shipmates. There was only three of us left. Three of us. So, that gives you an idea. That is the original ship, the one that was sunk right. by Japanese in 1942. Right. Mike, is, Mr. Martin is going to help me remind me of things, but I will give you a rough <laughs> idea of what went on and what we did. I was 17 when World War I, when World II was hit Pearl Harbor. I would be 18 New Year's Day. It was a draft. I would have been drafted in the Army, and I said, to hell with that, I might as well ride a ship. At least I'll have a place to sleep. I wouldn't be walking up and down the roads. So that's why I joined the Navy. I left Baltimore. Those of you, have you all been to Inner Harbor? Yeah. A lot of you. Well, that used to be all docks. And there used to be little ships there that would go overnight to Norfolk, and the beaches and the little places. So we went aboard one of them little ships and they took me and a bunch of other guys to Norfolk, Virginia, where we went through boot camp. That picture you see of me was when I was two weeks in boot camp. I was 18 years old. That's the picture you saw of me up there. I thought I was an admiral. If you look on my sleeve, you'll see one little stripe. That's when you're a rookie. When you get out of boot camp, you get three stripes on your arm. That means you're a first-class seaman. You've graduated. You'll get leave, but you better pass the swimming test or you don't go on leave. You had to go up and down the pool once, and they just threw you in the water. If you didn't swim, you went down and they pull you out. So that's how that happened. I went to boot camp. It's six weeks. When you're in boot camp, you learn a lot about the Navy. And what you do is you decide whether you want to go to sea right away or you want to go to school. They have 
40, 50 different schools that you can go to. I went to hospital corps school. I became a hospital corpsman. When I finished that, they sent me down the road to the U.S. Naval Air Station in Norfolk, Virginia, where I worked there. And then I worked at the U.S. Navy Hospital in Norfolk, Virginia for a little while. While I was there, I decided I wanted to go to another school instead of going to sea duty. So I entered the dental school. I became a oral hygienist. I learned dentistry. I worked with a dentist next to his bent, next to his table, and I was there for months. I stayed at the Naval Air Station. Then I got a, I had a, a ship down to a place, of those who know, know North Carolina, to Cape Hatteras. Cape Hatteras is close to the Cherry, which is Cherry Point Marine Base down there. I was in a little town called Manio, which is in Cape Hatteras. There was only 20 of us there. There was me, a dentist, a hospital corpsman, a doctor, and a few other men. Our job was air, sea, rescue. We used to stand on the shoreline. You ain't gonna believe this, but this is the truth. We used to wave to the Germans. The submarines used to come there. They used to be off the coast of North Carolina waiting for the American ships. We used to wave at them, but we you were there primarily to rescue Marines, recruits that were learning to be pilots. And what they would do would be in their ship, in their plane, come into Cape Hatteras, hit the ground, and take off again so that they could practice carrier bounce landings. A lot of them would go shoot into the water. So we had a PT boat there. We would go out and rescue them. That was what we did. I was there for a little while, and then I was shipped to Camp Perry, Virginia, in Williamsburg, Virginia, where they were forming the construction battalions, which you know as the CBs, that's what they were called, construction battalions. My job there as a hospital corpsman was to accompany them when they were shipped out. For instance, they would go to Gulfport, Mississippi, or they would go to Port Wyneme, California, or up in Rhode Island. That's where they were shipped from there out to the Pacific or the Atlantic, wherever they were going. I was ship's company. I would take a train from there back to Camp Perry. That was my duty there. So for a year, over a year and a half, I didn't do nothing but accompany and go to all these different places. But that was the job I had. While I was there, I got it. Me, a boy named Stewart, who was a chief petty officer, I became a second class petty officer, got orders to report to Boston, Massachusetts. They were building a new ship. It was going to be called the USS Canberra. I became what is known as a plank owner. When you're assigned to a new ship, and it's going to be commissioned into the Navy, and you're aboard, you became what they call a plank owner. So that's what I became. So that's basically when you're walking up the plank for the very first time. Nobody's ever been that's what that. That's where that started. That's where that started. They called you a plank owner. So me and these two guys that I met in... Uh, in 
in Harrisburg who were aboard my ship. I didn't even know them, but there was three of us there. One of them was as old, as old as me, and he said to me, what? Oh, I thought you wanted me to say. He said, don't you remember me? I said, no. I said, I don't remember much of everything. And he rolled his sleeve up, and on his arm, he had a scar. And he said, do you remember this? And I said, hell yeah, that's the arm I showed up during the war. And then I remembered it. That's when he had his reunion like a year ago, 75 years later. He died. I didn't see him this year. So there's only two of us left. We have a little newspaper, and it lists all the guys that died that last year and this year, and the list gets longer and longer. So as far as I know, there's only a couple of us left. From there, we were told we were going to the Pacific, so we got ready to leave, and we left Boston, Massachusetts. I think Mike has the date, yeah, don't you, Mike? October 14, 1944, when you left. Uh, 40, October 13, 43. Right, 43 you left. Didn't October 43, <laughs> we left Boston. We went to the Panama Canal. We went through the Panama Canal to the Pacific, where we joined the, pro the crew of the Third Fleet at Pearl Harbor, which, will ad which was Admiral Bull Halsey's crew. That was the big, the big third, ta third task force. That's when we started going. Now, would you ask you a question? When you were at Pearl, and you were, we were talking about that on the way over, Go ahead. What, what was Pearl Harbor like when you got there a couple years after the attack? Well, you got to remember, the Nevada, the Pennsylvania, near Arizona, the West Virginia, the, the, the battleships were a desert, the disaster. The Arizona is the one you read about all the time that blew up with all the men aboard, which is the memorial now. I don't know if any of you had a chance to go to ever go to Pearl Harbor, but if you do, the men that were aboard that ship are still down there. They were never touched. There's a little drop of oil that leaks 24-7 from that ship. All that men are still down there. And they had 1,177 guys who were killed almost instantly because when the Japanese dropped this one bomb down, it was an armor-piercing bomb, it went through the deck. What happened is they hit the ammunition and it blew up. And those were all partially destroyed or totally destroyed, and it was a disaster there. When we got there, we didn't even realize what had happened. Let me interject a point. The Japs did not follow up that attack. If Yamamoto would have done a second attack, we wouldn't be here today. He, he, he pulled out because he said, and this is history, that he wanted all the carriers to go back to Japan and he was worried they wouldn't have enough fuel to get back. So he did not attack the second time. If he would have attacked with his second outfit, they would have owned Pearl Harbor 
That's how bad it was. I'm sure what some of you have seen the movie Pearl Harbor, have you? Have nobody ever seen it? The movie Pearl Harbor? You need to watch it. You'll see what it was like. Anyway, we left. We became what's known as the Beat Flit. Fleet. B A I T. Bull Halsey wanted to draw the Japanese. Oh, by the way, we were saved because our carriers weren't at Pearl Harbor. They were out 500 miles away. Whoever thought of taking them out of there, I don't know. But that saved us. What happened was that morning, right before the attack happened... Yeah, they'd attack, we would have been lost. Right. The, the carriers were anyway, we became what was known as the bait fleet. Bull Halsey's point was, if he saw that we weren't didn't have the carriers there with planes, they would attack while we were out in the oceans. So that's what we became. And they did that a lot of times. But we then started fighting back. I think Mike has a map. I did it, right? Well, let me show it to you. So, this is his ship. We'll get back to that in a second. Yeah. Let me, uh... Uh, Mike has a map. He's going to show you where we were. Where we were. What we did. We were at Corregidor, Wake Island, the Admiralty Islands, the Marianas, all of those all places. This is Pearl. You remember, the Pacific Ocean is extremely huge. It's much bigger than the Atlantic. The United States is way over here, and the Battle Midway is here. You have Pearl Harbor where things started for us. Right. And Iwo Jima, Okinawa, he fought in Iwo Jima, uh, Okinawa. He fought off the Formosa uh, coast. He was down here in Corregidor and a whole lot of other places his ship was. We have, we supported our troops. You got to remember, we had big guns. We had five inch guns. We had Marines aboard. We had a catapult plane. We had the big guns. We could stay five miles away and fire on the Japs. But we supported most of the landings. There were a few that we had as a result. We own about seven, seven actual battle stars on our uniforms, and we have a bunch of medals. But we were in actual seventeen battles, and that's right. October nineteenth, October. I told Mike this this morning. I didn't realize until a few months ago. The date that we were hit was Friday the 13th, 1944. We were off the coast and in a little place doing reconnaissance work, and we were hit by a Japanese plane with an aerial torpedo. Our ship was like this and we had rolled in the water. It hit us below the armor line, and all 24 men in the engine room were killed. All 24. We have photos in here. Uh, things are actually working here, but um, you guys, I'll show them to you a little bit later. There are actual photographs in here of the ship and the destruction. It's pretty yeah, expensive. I'll tell you. But we had pictures that Mike will show you. I think it, they'll be able to show them to you. Yeah, I've got them over here. He's got them all, and you'll mm -hmm. see them. We were we we were take, we were hit. We lost all our engines. We were dead in the water. Now, where were you hit on the ship? So there's the ship here. You right. You hit below the armor. Is that correct? Right. Yes. So the armor plate comes down. We were hit below the armor, where the engine room is. And that's why we were hit so bad. Who were you when the thing was hit? Um, my battle—that—that's <laughs> a good part. My battle station right 
was on the bridge the where the captain was. So I had a good spot. Otherwise, uh, here. otherwise my sleeping berth right was three floors below the big guns. That's where sick day was. So we were usually in sick day, or if, if the guy had a headache, we'd get two aspirin cells come back for more. We didn't worry about that. But that's what it was. That ship survived that, 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 that torpedo. I've got something here I'm going to pass around. Yeah, you might want to hold on to this. this you want to hold on to that. And I'll explain to you what that is. Yeah, you You'll see on. how heavy it is. And after you, a bunch of you look at it, I'll tell you what it is, and then you'll realize what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's an Asprey now. Yeah. And they, we had a guy that built that, that made that ashtray, and it's got our name on it. Our, 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 our mascot was a kangaroo, and our motto was can do. That's why we were called the Canberra. We were a battle, a heavy cruiser, uh, and we our slogan was "Can do." That thing that you just held, I'll tell you now, was part of the torpedo that hit us. That was taken from the engine room, and a guy on our ship made a ashtray out of that torpedo metal. It's solid, solid, 100% brass. That's why it's so heavy. When it gets to you, you'll realize how heavy that is. Now that's a torpedo. That's torpedo. That was part of the torpedo that was left behind. We were towed when we were hit. I'll give you a side throw. We had no engines, we had no water, we had nothing. And the night that we were hit, we were taken out of the battle line and pulled out by, tow, by a tow, the ship that took our place was called the USS Helena, H-E-L-E-N-A. It was hit by three torpedoes by the Japs, and all 1,600 men went down with it. That would have been us. We were lucky. They took us and towed us away. That ship took our place, and those guys never came home, and I thank them. They saved us, but we lost them. Uh, the Japs came after us, but we got them. We got them good. We went and had more battle, all in different battles. And at Midway, we sunk three of their carriers, three or four of their battleships, and that turned the whole war around that we beat the hell out of them. And that's where from there we were towed to the Marianas Islands. They patched us up a little bit. And then the USS Wichita, which I also had pictures you'll see, towed us back toward Pearl Harbor and then an ocean-going tugboat towed us. It took them two months, and they towed us back to Boston, Massachusetts. And we were repaired in Boston, Massachusetts. And we were there when the atomic bomb went off. And it wasn't long before after that that we came to USS, we came to Baltimore, Maryland, down at Fort Avenue for the U.S. Navy Day in Navy in November 
of 1945, we were here. Our ship came up to Chesapeake Bay and was in Fort at the Fort of Foot Avenue. Mike's got a whole bunch of pictures and things to show you. I do. You, so as you see. There's a tremendous amount. These are all from the National Archives. You were able to get. Uh, there's a big magazine book up here. Yeah. All of you are welcome to go through it and see the pictures. Look at all the damage that happened in the engine room, and you'll understand what we went through. Uh, the, um, uh, also, if, if you guys have any, anybody have any questions at this point, would you like to answer each one about You got questions, I'll be glad to answer whatever I can. I can't hear her. How long could a naval engagement take? You know, How long what? Could a naval engagement take? Sometimes was four, five, six hours. We were at Wake Forest, uh, Wake Island, for three days. We were at Iwo Jima where they raised that flag for three weeks before we beat them. Three weeks, three weeks, we were at, off the coast of Japan where we were torpedoed for five days doing reconnaissance work. So battles sometimes was a two day. There was 18,000 men we lost at, o at, at Okinawa in case Iwo Jima. You never hear about that. 18,000 men the United States lost. The Japs lost more than that. But we put that flag up and we beat the hell out of them. But we lost a lot of men. Today, every day, every single day, they have not start searching for men all over the Pacific that are American seamen soldiers, marines, that they find new graves or new people that found bodies every single day of the year. We had 16 million men in the service in World War II. Right now, in the Navy, we're losing 100 men every week. There ain't many of us left. Next two weeks from now, I'll be 95 years old. I'm lucky. Just lucky. Let me ask you a question. Your, your wife, your first wife? Sergeant? My first wife was a sergeant at the Pentagon in the wax. In the wax. I have an older son who was a... Was a helicopter pilot and during the Korean War was stationed in the Philippines. I have another son that was stationed that was in the 50s off the coast of Lebanon and he was in the Gulf War. I have a brother who became a sea, deep sea diver, was aboard the USS Savannah in World War II. Him I like to talk about. He's the one that had it better than anybody. He lived in Miami, Florida in a hotel where the ship was and he was a CD diver. So my sons, my other son, Marie, me, my brother, we were lucky. We all came home, and we were just lucky. I seen somebody here got a question. Yeah, question. Let's have some. Let's hear it. Yes. What do we got? Go ahead, Ted. You Go ahead. Did you, did you say you actually saw the, the atomic bomb drop? No, no. He I, was in Boston when it went off. When it went off. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I didn't hear him. He was talking about the atomic bomb, but you were in Boston when oh. that went off. Is what you had said was your no. show. What else? Go ahead. When the torpedo hit your ship, what was your first reaction? What? When the torpedo hit your ship, what was your first reaction? 
My first was a reaction was I can't swim good. What the hell do I do now? I said, I said, I remember saying one thing. I said to the officer today, that the, not the captain, you don't talk to the captain. I'll tell you a funny story about the captain. I said to the officer today, what the hell do we do now? I don't swim that good. He said, you better blow them pants up because you will be floating. <laughs> but we were lucky. I remember the first day I went aboard the Canberra. When you went aboard the ship, you went straight, saluted the flag, and talked to the officer today and said permission to come aboard. So I came aboard. I walked around at the deck and I walked up this little areaway and the first thing I knew was some, some damn Marine had me by the neck behind my collar. He said, where the hell are you going? I said, I just came aboard. I'm walking up there. He said, that's the captain's walk. Nobody goes up there. So I said, well, glad to know that. I won't go there again. But I was, I didn't know. Uh, we did have a, a squadron of Marines aboard were terrific. I met a bunch of them when I went to St. Louis um, in Harrisburg this past year. You got to remember, 1,600 men aboard ship, you didn't meet a lot of them. I didn't know too many guys when I went on Liberty in Boston. I'd meet guys and say, well, your ship, they say the Canberra. I said, I'm on the Canberra, where are you? He said, I'm in the engine room or I'm up on a deck, or I'm a seaman over here. You got to remember, we had a barber shop, a cafeteria, a store. And that's another thing. I started smoking when I was aboard ship. I used to smoke a pipe when I was a youngster. I didn't have no place to carry a pipe, so I started smoking cigarettes. That's when I learned how to smoke. And the funny thing is, those of you who can remember, there used to be a little guy on television, and his name was, they used to call him, called for Philip Morris. He used to be a little guy. That's the only cigarette we had aboard ship. We used to pay 50 cents a carton for a carton of cigarettes. 50 cents, but you were rationed. You only got one carton each week. Now, how much money did you make as a... As a huh? How much money were you guys paid to be in the service department? Oh, I don't remember some things. You got to allow for everything. I know one thing. The only thing we had aboard ship, we didn't have water. We got a picture of another ship giving us water because we didn't have no water. But we had a hell of a lot of beer. <laughs> a lot of beer. For two months we drank beer. That was the best part of the whole three and a half years I was out there. We had a lot of beer. Now let me ask you another question on this picture they can see over here. You, you may not be able to, but these big guns here? I can't hear you. these big guns on the ship you were talking about when they went off, what was that like? Yeah. We, I can't hear you, Mike. Well, I was just saying the big guns on the ship, when they oh. went off, what was that like? We, oh, I'll tell you what. The ten, the twelve-inch guns weren't bad. The big ones, where we slept, but on both sides of the ship, the starboard and the port bow, we had four or five-inch guns. If you didn't wear earplugs, it would blow your mind. They were the worst sounding. I don't know what caused it. Maybe it's because it's a, a, a short, a short. What do you call it? Barrel. Yeah, barrel. They were horrible. The Marines used to run the quad 40s on the, on the bow and the forward part of the ship. Mike's got a picture hidden at, in that, 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 the one with the cap going down. Oh, yeah, well. There's a picture of uh, when we were exploded, and there's a picture of the Jap being shot down by the Marines. 
If you look to the left of the ship, you'll see the jet plane going in the ocean. So that's another picture you can see. Who else had a question over How here? How many countries have you visited or been to? How many countries did you guys visit or? How many what? Countries. Like How many countries? You mean during our time there? I guess, yeah, well, you were at sea. You, you mean after the war? Yeah, like I'll tell you another story. Most of the guys, we have a little newspaper and we meet every year. Most of the guys that are left were 46, 50, 60, 70s, 80s. If, how many of you remember John, President Kennedy? A lot of you. Do you remember the missiles? It was a movie called The Missiles of October when the Russians were sending missiles to Cuba. Well, the USS Canberra was the ship that stopped the Russians from going there. We were the ship in the blockade. It was not the CA-70 then. It had been mothballed after the war in Pedro, California, in, in San Pedro. They took her out of mothballs, remodeled her, and she became the CAG-2, the second guided missile cruiser in the history of the Navy. She stopped the Russians from going to Cuba. She also, during Korea and Vietnam, went on a world tour all over the world as a, as a visitor from the Navy. And she must have been maybe 15, 20, 30 countries. I have a picture of her meeting the Prime Minister of Australia when we were taken out of service, the ship's bell was given to Australia. But I have something more important. I have a picture of President Bush. Mike has the picture. President Bush came aboard our ship and well, after he's out of service. Did you show him the picture? Not yet, no, but go ahead. I will tell you what it is when he puts it up. Well, they can't see it right now. They're going to have to come up here and see it. Yes. There are three caskets there. One is Korea. One is Vietnam. And the casket that President Bush picked out aboard my ship is now the unknown soldier from World War II. Yeah, yeah, there's a third, there's three caskets in here. I have a picture yeah. of President Bush picking the, the casket that will become the World War II unknown soldier in Arlington. Secretary, questions? Anybody else? Get some questions up here. Go ahead. Besides drinking and smoking, what did you do in your free time on the ship? The what? I said, besides drinking and smoking, what did you do on your free t in your free time on the ship? What did I do in the meantime? No, when you, free time. besides smoking and drinking, what did you do on the ship? Eat and sleep. <laughs> you got to remember, when you're going into battle, they said they, they said what they call Station Zebra. Everything is shut down. I would sit down by, before I was on the bridge. I'd be in sick bay. And what you did, you had cold sandwiches. There was no cooking. There was no nothing. All you would do was listen to the guns go off and hope the hell that you weren't sunk. That's what you do. And God forbid if somebody was hurt. I did have a guy come down and broke his leg. And I did spend two hours fixing his leg. 
and the old guy that died last year had cut him. But I'll tell you a couple other things that I did, which I forgot to tell you. When I was in North Carolina, we used to see the Germans, submarines. And for those of you that don't know it, they caught a German submarine in New York Harbor during the war. People don't know that, but there was a German submarine in New York, and they saw him, and they got him. But I did. There was a Norwegian, a Swedish, Sweden, not Norwegian. There was a Swedish ship that was sunk off the coast of North Carolina. We rescued a lot of the guys that didn't die off that ship. One of the guys was from Sweden, and he had cut across his face and his lips had been cut, and I rescued him and brought him ashore and sewed his mouth and his cheeks, and I have home a little ring that his daughter had given him, and he gave it to me as a souvenir, and I still have that little ring home. I also saved a guy where the Wright brothers used to fly in North Carolina. One of the guys aboard that worked with us had an automobile accident and was hurt there. And we lost two men there in Cape Hatteras from an automobile accident. But I'll tell you a funny one. When we were there, you ain't gonna believe this. They had a ship, a, a, a high school in Nanalu that had all girls. They didn't have anybody to do the girls' basketball games. So they asked us if we would help them. And I'll tell you a funny story. I went and refereed a girls' basketball game. I liked it so much, I became a basketball official when I got discharged. For 40 years, I was a basketball referee. I was a baseball umpire for 35 years, and I was a softball umpire for 45 years. Here, I did high schools, colleges, and basketball, and I retired when I was 90 years old, living in Ellicott City, was the last time I umpired. How about that? <laughs> 90 years old when I retired. 1994, I played in Michigan in a Senior World Series. 95, I played in the World Series. Senior. 97, I played in the World Series. 99, I played in the World Series. 2001 was the last year I played in the World Series, or it was 91 or 94. 94, that's right. I was, I was 70 years old, and I've got three World Series rings from playing softball. I was a hell of a player, a hell of a player. When we came back from, went from St. Boston to San Pedro, you had to have 36 points to be discharged. You got one point for each year you were out of the country and over, in, in the overseas. So I had 37, 38 points. I was there for a week. They put me on a troop train, and seven days later I was back in Baltimore, up in Bainbridge Naval Air Naval Training Station. Christmas 
1945, they discharged me, and I came home. That's it. And I'm still here. What about Scholar Clark? What about Scholar Clark? Go ahead. What's your first reaction going into battle? Your first reaction going into battle? I was scared to hell. I didn't know what I was going to do. We didn't carry a gun. We didn't have no gun. We carried a Red Cross on our arms. We were medics. We weren't supposed to be doing none of that stuff. And I said, well, what the hell do we do? What do I do if we, we, we go ashore to help out and, and I ain't got no gun? I sure ain't going to talk them out of it. So what do we do? But let me tell you all something. And I'm not bragging, but I'll tell you this. Join the service. Two years will never hurt you. You'll have the time of your life. You'll meet people from all over the world. You'll have a good time. You'll become a respected, good man. You'll learn everything. I remember coming last year, some of the kids, I asked Mark, Mr. Martin all the time, do you ever hear from the kids, like, I understand Nick is out in Colorado in the Air Force, a few of the other guys, I remember him, back there, it's good, don't be ashamed to go in the service, never hurts you. You become a good, respected person. I'm lucky I'm still here. One of three left from that battle, that ship, a heavy cruiser that made a man out of me and my sons, and it'll never hurt anybody. In fact, I know I shouldn't, but I am. I'm a firm believer in the draft. I think everybody turns 18 ought to spend two years in the service. It'll never hurt anybody. I know I've got granddaughters and I've got grandsons and great-grandsons and great-great-grandchildren. And I know some of, I know a couple of the girls are going in the, in the one in the Marines and one's going in the Army. And I know a couple of my grandchildren are going in the service, and I'm proud of them. Who else? Yes. How long were you in the uh, Navy for? Well. How long were you in the Navy for? I spent, I spent six years. I, the reason God got, got out is when I went, came to Baltimore, my wife at the time was pregnant and had been discharged from the army and i said no it ain't no sense me shipping over and leaving her to do everything by herself so i got discharged had it not been for that i would have stayed in for 20 years i enjoyed it i had a good time and I'm not sorry when I turned 18 that I went in and I enjoyed what I did. And also, when he, he was telling me driving over, I'll be there. He huh? paid $21 a month. Oh, yeah, we got, the, we got a hell of a pay. We got $21 a month. And then we got $50 a month. And then we got $66 a month. And then when I became second class, I got ninety-six dollars a month, so it wasn't, it wasn't. You know, you didn't get rich unless you wanted gambling. That's all you could do. Who else? Yeah. Cool. Have you ever been back to any of the islands where you had battles after? Four years ago, we had our four or five years ago. I don't even remember whether it was four years or five years. Our meet our our. Our reunion was in Canberra, Australia. The, the guys that didn't have the money to go 
whatever was left of us must have been, I think we had, if I remember correctly, and I'm not positive, I think we had 28 of us go. We helped pay for the guys that didn't have the money to go. We, now, I did try the last three days to call Australia Embassy in Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, every phone number that the operator gave me when I called them, it said, we're sorry, you'll have to have the operator help you. I was going to have the naval attache from Australia come here with me, but I wasn't able to get a hold of them. So that's on me. I'm sorry about that. I wanted to have him with me, but he, I didn't get him. Anybody else? Anybody else? Sorry, we got quite. Go ahead. Stand up. Had like any regrets in the service? Did you have any regrets in the service? I didn't hear you. Uh, she asked about any regrets being in the service. Not a one. Yeah, my regret. My regret is I lost a lot of shipmates, and I feel for the ones that never came back. There is a lot, a lot of mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters that never made it. I was just damn lucky. That's all I could say. Everything happens for a reason. So maybe I came back to tell you about it. I don't know. But it wasn't fun. It was fun, but it was serious fun. I'll tell you, if you ever get a chance, and I'm sure some of you in your later years will, Go to the Arlington National Cemetery. His first wife was buried there, military cemetery. Uh, it, it, Go it, there. You have to have some special criteria. Go there. there. It's worth going to see. Go to see the unknown soldier. Go to see what's missing. Go to see the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of crosses that are there. When something happens to me, my wife knows where I go. I go to Southern Maryland to the Veterans Cemetery. They've already got, they already know that I'll have a military wedding, I mean, <laughs> not a wedding, a military funeral when something happens to me. And that's where I'll be buried. They already have all the papers and everything that they have to have for me. And that's where I'll be. My brother's there. I'll be there. Who else? I hope I told you what you want to know. It ain't fun. You know, I, I don't know if you guys have any relatives who served in, say, the uh, World War II or not a grandparents. There are pictures up here you ought to see. Yeah, when you get a chance, why don't you guys, if you want to come up and take a look at this, say something to Mr. Sauber, that's perfectly fine. We've got about seven, eight, nine, maybe put a bell ring. Uh, we'll just dismiss from this. We can say anything. you have a question? Yeah, what was your favorite thing about um, What was your favorite thing about being in the service? Uh, the what? Your favorite thing about being in the service. What's in my favorite? Yeah. I guess how lucky I am to have gone through 17 battles and a torpedo, and I'm still here. I'm damn lucky. I'm not one of the 24 guys that I will never forget helping taken out of those dead bodies taken out of that engine room. When you see those pictures, You'll know what I'm talking about. It, it, you just won't believe what you're going to see. You will not believe it. What happens when you're hit with a torpedo 
and it was an aerial torpedo, which is the worst kind. I, it, it ain't, it ain't a lot of fun. Uh, uh, I enjoy going to that reunion every year, but like I did this past year, I don't always have all the ex extra money to go fly to St. Louis or spend three days at a house, at a hotel. Uh, Harrisburg, I drove up. Next year, my daughter gonna send me to Chicago. I'll go there if I'm still here. I hope I am. But when I go there, there'll only be two of us, I guess. And it's just hard to believe that there's only two of us left. It's just hard to believe. Who else? Anybody else? Huh. All right, well, I thank you for coming here. Thank you a lot. And, I, and don't forget what I said. I'm no damn hero. I'm just an every gay guy that got lucky. That's all it is. I will tell you one th other thing. Two years ago, the Howard Community College had four of us there. It was me, a guy that landed at Normandy in Europe, a black guy that was at Iwo Jima, had three Purple Hearts, had been wounded three times, and another guy that was in, in the Marines that was at Corregidor. I met all three of them. We were asked, how did we feel that we're all home? And I will tell you what happened. Back in 1940, for those of you that know or can remember, the black people that were in the service weren't the same as they are from 1964 with civil rights the way they are today. Back then, in the Navy, all they did was serve the officers. They were not like the rest of us. They weren't treated like the rest of us, and they weren't like the rest of us. I'm not saying it was fair, unfair. I had nothing to do with it. But they asked the guy at Howard Community College with three purple hearts on his uniform, how did he feel when he came home to Baltimore, Maryland from Normandy in Europe? And you know what his answer was? There was no damn difference. I still had to use a separate bathroom, and I just had <laughs> three purple hearts. That means he was wounded three times in that battle. He, he was, was wounded, wounded three, three times. Nice when he came back here. And when he came home, they didn't even give a damn. I won't forget that. Nothing changed. It was 18 years before it changed, and I won't never forget that. <laughs>